Hey everybody, welcome to another video. I had to have everything set out for some pictures for insurance purposes. So we're gonna do a mic lacquer tour. Let's get down to it. So if you've never seen the channel before, this is Recording Studio Loser. I am Resident Loser Jeremy. We talk about all things recording studio, talk about the philosophy behind a lot of things and just kind of the lifestyle mindset. Today, we're gonna to be talking about microphones. And unless I've forgotten a few, this is every mic that I have in the studio laid out on this table. Now I have had some different questions on these mics themselves, but real quick, let's just kind of run down what they all are and I'll really quickly touch on every one. I say really quickly, but I've got my coffee here and you should have your beverage of choice as well because there's a lot of stuff on this table and this is gonna take a little bit. So if you're in for a nerdy deep dive on some microphones, let's go. First off, somebody asked a question, how do you go about choosing mics and then how quickly can you identify mics just by hearing them? I'll get different references from different producers on vocal sounds that we're trying to achieve for any particular session. And you have to kind of be able to pick out the differences between something. Like when you're listening to an SM7 versus a tube condenser versus a ribbon. And those things sound differently. And you can kind of slowly pick up what those things are. Before we jump into all of that, let's kind of talk about the collection as a whole and kind of what I started and how I ended up with all of this stuff. Uh, somebody asked, what was the last mic that I purchased? And honestly, the last mic that I purchased is this blue. I found this on Facebook Marketplace of all places. I have plans for this guy. It was only like 40 bucks. He gave me the mic, the shock mount, a ton of different mic stands. And I'm gonna switch out the capsule on this. So if you're into how to change a really, really cheap mic into something that sounds really good, hopefully, go ahead and subscribe for that because we will be putting a very nice capsule in this as soon as I can get a hold of one. Stay tuned for that. On the realm of talking about cheap mics that are made to sound really, really cool, uh, one of the best discount mics, in my opinion, the Audio Technica. 2020. Now this no longer is a 2020, but even before I modded it, this was one of my favorite mics. Now this is an Audio-Technica 2020, but it has been completely gutted. There's a kit on micparts.com for this mic specifically to change out all the guts and the capsule itself. And this thing is awesome. Now, this thing now hits well above its weight class for the price and it's shocking. So if you're into discount mics, Audio-Technica 2020 should be pretty high on that list. Get it used because it's a tank. And if you want to do that mod, I'll put a link down to that in the description. And there will be links to as much of this stuff as I can find because some of it is pretty old and you can't find it anymore. But if you're interested in any of these, I will have information in the description below. One of the lesser known mics, and honestly, this one rarely gets used because a lot of producers don't know what it is and don't really trust it. An RE38. I had one of these in my old college studio. I remember I used it on tuba and snare drums, and it sounded so cool. I finally found one myself. Now I have changed the cabling in here because that did go bad. This is a super old mic, uh, EV RE38 ND. It's got a switchable EQ on the back. And this thing is just too cool. Such a neat mic. And wherever you think about using like a 57, this could be a nice compliment to that. Or just when you don't want that kind of gritty 57 sound, this has a little bit more of like a bottom end, especially if you have it in the neutral EQ position. But what makes it super versatile are those EQ moves on the back. And being able to literally dial in whatever you want. Super cool, super versatile mic. You don't happen to see a lot of. Over here, I've got basically just boundary mics. These things are great for just putting in weird places in your studio, if you, especially if you wanna pick up a really interesting room sound and you don't have a particularly large room. This can go on a wall, on the floor, on the ceiling. You can mount them anywhere and kind of forget about them. I had this one in my vestibule and this is just a CAD. Nothing special about this mic whatsoever. It's dirt cheap, but you can put those anywhere. Now this one, a Shure Beta 91, this bad boy is almost always in my kick drums, uh, either that or the classic D112. I do love this mic, uh, but for some reason, and I don't know if this is the case with all D112s, but this one constantly breaks on me. I don't know why that keeps happening. <laughs> More often than not, this is on the kick in. As far as kick out goes, uh, anymore, I'm using this, a Mictech CV4. This is a Mictech CV4. This is a tube condenser. 
probably one of the most underrated mics out there. Now it's not a super cheap mic, but as far as really good tube condensers go, this is a very, very cheap mic, especially if you can pick it up used. This was my first nice mic that I ever got. This was the first part of my vocal chain for a long, long time. It sounds fantastic on the human voice, fantastic on acoustic guitars. Oddly enough, falling in love with this thing on kick out. Uh, it's hard to not talk about a C414. There, This is probably one of the most versatile adaptations of a mic. I have no idea how many versions of a C414 there are. I couldn't really tell you the difference between all of them, but I know this is the XLS and I really, really like it. A lot of times I'll put it on a figure eight pattern and just set it in front of an acoustic guitar and that just sounds like acoustic guitar to me. That said, this can be anything. I love it on a drum room, fairly close, almost to the floor drum room where you can just crush it. It sounds great. It's awesome as like a mono overhead. It's great as a vocal mic. It's If you're gonna make one nice mic, this could be on the short list for that. Uh, this is just a measurement mic for sonar works. Uh, that said, I have found some interesting uses for this. If you just want something crazy flat that has absolutely no character, no color whatsoever, just something as accurate as possible, it's actually pretty cool. So get a measurement mic. I have three of these, the Earthworks DM20s, and they are quickly becoming some of my favorite drum shell microphones. Drum shells are definitely one of the more particular things where I'm changing these the most out of anything on the drum kit. They just have a, such an interesting character and I think a lot of that comes from the fact that whatever bleed you do get in this sounds fantastic. The bleed sounds great. Where if you're miking with an MD421, MD421 sounds fantastic on a, a tom. It just is that sound of toms for so many people. The bleed on this sounds like trash. <laughs> Whatever else you're gonna get from the kit, if you don't mic it super carefully and the rest of the kit doesn't sound really good, it's gonna show all the flaws in your drum kit where this, it just sounds really, really cool. And I don't worry about gating nearly as much as I used to because with these on the floor toms, uh, you kind of get like a really cool spot mic of a cymbal as well. And it's, it doesn't bug me like it would with some other mics. Like my old favorite on Tom's was the KSM 32. Definitely, I feel like I've said this about so many mics, but this is a workhorse if there ever was one. This, you can put it on anything. When you don't know what you want on something, reach for the KSM 32 because it'll give you a really good picture of what it sounds like under a mic. And then you can make an adjustment from there. I love this on Tom's, I love it on guitar cabs amps, acoustics, but it's definitely not the first thing that I reach for. Definitely fills in holes. Maybe for another video we can get on how to choose for certain things, but when I don't know what to mic something up with, I normally reach for this. And I'm never disappointed. Uh, this is my own homemade ribbon mic, which is currently not functioning, but when it was working, it sounded great. I do plan to fix this ribbon motor and get it up and running again because I love Ribbon mics. Hit subscribe if you want to check that one out. I feel like we're working this way, so let's just go down that line. The EVRE 20. I feel like you see this in so many studios. Uh, to me, this is kind of a, a meh mic. There's nothing wrong with it. I just feel like I also have an SM7B and they do very, very similar things. In a pinch, if I had to use one mic on a kick, this is a good option for that where you really don't want just the clicky attack of a 91, and you just don't want just a woof of what's coming out of a kick out mic. This is a nice balance mic, but it's not something to write home about. It's just one of those things that gets a job done. Not super glamorous, not high on a list to purchase if I was purchasing mics again. This next one should be a testament to why you should always look at pawn shops. Probably one of the more interesting pairs of mics that I have. These are vintage. <laughs> These are PML. DC 63s, I'm not sure if you can see that on the camera. But the way you change the pattern on this mic, there's a dial right here, and there are switches at the bottom where, let me see if you can hear this. And setting the number here and the combination of patterns around it is how you can change the polar pattern of this mic. Back when I first got it, somebody told me this was the first switchable pattern mic. I'm not totally sure if that's true, but it is pretty old. And as you can see, it's tiny. This is very, very small. Here it is against the KSM32, which is not a particularly large mic anyway. Somebody asked what my favorite microphones for overheads are. This is it. Uh, these are fantastic. 
I have no idea how to find them. I don't know if they exist anymore outside of that one pawn shop that I happen to walk into, but these are great. And I think PML was what either before or after my lab. I think my lab turned into PML or PML turned into my lab. I'm not really sure. Either way, those sound fantastic. Sheps MK21s. These are a stereo match pair of Sheps CMC sixes with the MK21 capsules on top. There is a really funny story about this that I was out hanging around a sound booth when I was younger. That's what I, I assume that's what we all did. You're here doing audio stuff. You hang around the sound booth. I saw a really cool box sitting around and the engineer knew I was super into cigars and I mentioned that box would be really cool as a humidor. Didn't know if there's anything inside. He said, oh, you can have that. What's in there is broken. I didn't even look inside until weeks later I found these. Didn't know what they were. Didn't know how much they were worth. Uh, turns out they were not broken. Uh, I have no idea how to get a hold of that person ever again. All they needed was phantom power and they work. And these are some of the finest small condenser microphones I have ever used. These are real big in like the classical world, but uh, they're fantastic as overheads. When you want something just like surgically precise, very, very smooth and very true to the source. Uh, these are these are salty and I didn't pay a dime for them. So uh, this is a Behringer mic, nothing special here. This is when I need something somewhere and I don't really care how it sounds. If it's using as a trigger for something or to open a gate on something, that's what I use this for. Otherwise it doesn't sound particularly great. Can't handle much SPLs. It's not cool on a snare. Um, yeah, there you go. A Gefell UMT-70, uh, it is broken. And I think that's a common thing uh, with Gefell. And again, I had this in college and I fell in love with this mic because one of my old bands, we recorded my vocals on a mic like this and I loved it. So I kind of made it a mission to track one down. I got it and it hasn't worked for years. <laughs> and it's really hard to find somebody who can work on these. So anybody knows anybody, let me know. Otherwise, a very cool mic. If you want that kind of Neumann sound without paying a Neumann price tag, this should be where you look. SM7B, easily, quickly recognizable mics outside of an SM57. Really, really cool if you're doing like a pop thing or a vocal thing and you want like an aggressive, in your face thing, really cool on screamers. Uh, it distorts really, really nicely. That said, it's not my first choice for vocals, but it is a gain hog. Next. Soyuz 017 tube condenser. Besides just being stunningly beautiful, uh, this thing sounds just as good as it looks and it is heavy. Uh, second only to the R44 and its weight. Um, that thing is just stunning on vocals and that's pretty much where it's gonna sit for me. Cause I find I want to separate a vocal from something to not use the same mic whenever possible. If, if I'm using a mic on something else, somewhere else in the mix, Ideally, I want the vocal to be different. Just my habit. I'm not saying that's the way to do it, but this is my all-time favorite. Good Lord. <clears throat> this hefty boy, an AEA R44. Oh, good Lord. It is very, very heavy, and it sounds enormous on whatever you put it on. This is a killer vocal mic. Hard to find something that sounds like this. And for those asking, how do you identify something? If you listen to enough microphones, you just kind of know what a ribbon sounds like. If you want just this crazy intimate sound where it sounds fast, you can hear every little sound in a singer because these are meant to pick up pretty far away. Um, they are on the more fragile side and the very expensive side. But that said, you can get decent ribbons for decent prices. You don't have to have an R44 to kind of get in this area of stuff. But that said, it is a stunningly beautiful microphone. More often, I'm using this as a room mic or a kick out mic. Um, but when you really want kind of that intimate vocal sound or guitar sound, this is really, really hard to beat. Definitely up there if you're gonna have a flagship mic of any kind. Onto another AEA mic, this is the R88. This is a stereo ribbon mic and I love this thing for a drum room. This sounds absolutely magical as a drum overhead and you don't have to fuss with the phase. As long as you get the little line pointing at whatever source, then you have a left and a right 
that's just always in perfect phase with each other and it sounds magical. Now that said, you do not have to use this as a stereo mic. I oftentimes will just use one side of this mic and put it on a guitar cab or put it on an acoustic guitar or there are some situations where I'm recording like live studio stuff and putting it in front of a player. If you place it right, you can have one element picking up the vocal, one element picking up the guitar and they're pretty well separated from each other. Really cool mic, and if you're gonna pick up a stereo one, this should be high up on the list. Awesome microphone. To be fair, I did tell you this was gonna be a long video. So here we kind of come to the bare essentials of what a studio normally has, and that's 57s. So this is a standard 57. I haven't done anything to it. And then this is a 57 with the transformer removed. There would be no way to know that outside of the fact that I have a sticker on there that says no transformer, no phantom power. Because you can damage it when you take out the transformer if you happen to have phantom power on. And my third version of a 57 is a Grinelli elbow, which makes it really easy for miking stuff like a snare drum when you need to get in there. And this doesn't have the transformer on it. Jeremy, why did you take all the transformers out of your 57s? Uh, it sounds great and it's really not hard to do. You do have to use a heat gun and or a pot of boiling water to melt the glue to get these little transformers out of there. That said, it's an easy mod. Don't attempt it unless you're comfortable. It's easy, it's not hard to do. I think it makes them sound great. Albeit they do come back with a lot less output. So you need to have the preamps to be able to push the gain of these into it, but you, it, what you end up with, a little more low end, just a quicker microphone in general, sounds awesome. But having a standard 57 around when you just want that 57 predictable sound, you can't beat it. And these things are so durable, you can use them as hammers. So not that I've ever done that. I have. Uh, a couple SM58s. These are awesome to have around when you're just doing scratch vocals with a band in a room. A lot of times I set these up with talk boxes around the studio so players can have their own talk backs and talk to each other during a session. Super helpful. MD421s. These are the sounds of toms for a lot of people. They also sound really killer on vocals and guitar cabs. Definitely one of the cooler dynamic mics you can get. Now there are the higher end versions of these, like the 441s. Personally never used it because the 421s are just great to me, especially the older ones, if you can get your hands on these. These are not the older ones. I have used the older ones. They do sound different. If this is all you can get your hands on, still a really cool mic, but the worst design for a mic clip on the planet. It is inevitable, you will bump this, you will drop it at the most inopportune time on the most expensive drum kit you have in your studio. It's gonna happen. Can't even get the dang thing back on. That mouse sucks. And then there's a couple SM81s. I have a real vintage one and then kind of a newer one. These are just great as spot mics. Hi-hats, this just sounds like a hi-hat to me. All that said, it works on guitar cabs, it works on acoustic guitars. You could even use this as a vocal in some situation. Really, really cool. And you probably noticed that I don't have some of the legendary microphones that some studios do have, and that is kind of on purpose. I don't have U87s. I don't particularly like the sound of a U87. That said, it's a hefty investment for something that you don't really, really like, and other mics can kind of get that job done, especially when the goal is to sound different. Guys, I believe that is it that is talking about every microphone on this table. I am gonna come back, I'm gonna do a little more deep dive with some of the questions that you guys posted. We'll answer those, stay tuned for a part two video on that. If you're interested in any of these or you have any other questions about these, I will be in the comments below, ask away. Anyway guys, I'm Resident Loser Jeremy. I hope you enjoyed checking a look at my mic locker. If you're new here, hit that subscribe button. If you like this one, hit the like button. I will see you in the next one.